Hey folks, uh, good morning. Let's get started with the webinar this morning. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us, uh, kind of revisiting a topic that we covered uh, last year and thought it made sense to kind of continue into uh, seeing how things transpired last year and then really what's ahead of us for 2021. But with that, hi, I'm Scott King, CTO here at Mobius Partners. Excited, uh, as you can see maybe in the background, excited about being in our Dallas office this morning. Uh, just, just nice to get out of the get out of the house and uh, start to see an increase in on-site activities with our customers and partners. So super excited about that. A little bit, a little bit of normalcy going on. But uh, anyways, uh, like I mentioned today, we wanted to revisit a topic we covered last year uh, with James Morrison at HPE uh, on the topic of cybersecurity in 2020. You know, after the pandemic started in 2020, you know, did a, did a webinar back then. So really you know, kind of wanted to revisit that, see how things transpired, as I mentioned, and see what's ahead of us for 2021. Topics we'll cover today are uh, 2021 COVID-19 landscape and potential threats, how to protect your organization against these threats, top security threats in 2021. James will be covering those topics in a presentation format, and then we'll uh, move into more of a discussion format on some of the current events out there today. Uh, you know, those around FBI hacking U.S. companies, talk a little bit about that, uh, supply chain vulnerabilities, as well as uh, uh, a hot topic these days, SD, SD-WAN increased security, um, and uh, uh, really just SD-WAN really in the enterprise and the use of it and some of the security threats around that, so we'll get into that in our, in our discussion. Before we get started, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Mobius Partners, I was gonna, uh, I'll be doing a quick overview on who we are and what we do, and then I'll turn it over to James Morrison. We'll do a 20 minute overview there. And then after he wraps up with that, I'll ask uh, Shannon Gillenwater, our security practice manager at Mobius Partners to join us as well. We'll get into a little round table discussion with James on those current event topics that I talked about. So with that, let's uh, let's get into the company overview here. So yeah, uh, for, for Mobius Partners, we've been in business now, uh, celebrated our 20 year anniversary last fall. So super excited about that and looking looking forward to the uh, what the next 20 years has in store for us, right? It's always uh, lots of change going on in our industry. And, and uh, for those of us at Mobius, just you know, take pride in keeping up with that change and working with our customers and, and focused on their needs and the outcomes that they're looking we have offices in in the Texas region where we take really a, uh, an approach to where we're looking to be an extension of your team, of our customers' teams, uh, really looking at you know, additional senior resources to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve as an organization. Uh, offices in Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio, and we also have a presence in Austin uh, here in the Texas market, and uh, we'll get into kind of, you know, who we focus on from a customer segment and size of companies here in a minute. But uh, again, uh, customer centric philosophy and you'll find that uh, all the things that are kind of uh, expected, you know, we execute on at the highest level and that's just being available, you know, doesn't matter what time of day or what day it is, uh, we're gonna jump in and help, you know, when, it, when, when the need arrives. So being responsive in those types of use cases as well. One of the things that helps us do that is the investment uh, that we've made from a resource perspective, uh, helping us, helping us, you know, cover, cover our customers, you know, uh, from a sales, from a, a technical perspective, having the expertise around the technologies and the processes and uh, you know, strategic initiatives that you guys have, and and uh, helping you know apply technology to those to uh, get the outcomes that you're looking for. Uh, so big investment there in the, in the team uh, and really look at it, not from just helping, you know, uh, maybe with the assessment, the design and architecture, but really the execution of that. So not selling you something and hoping or relying on somebody, somebody else to deliver it. We're going to own that uh, the life cycle with you to make sure that whatever was sold is, is uh, becoming a reality and, and uh, you're seeing the value out of that solution that, that was, that you invested in. Uh, and again, just, you know, laser focused on being responsive, accountable, uh, you know, accurate with the proposals and, and what we're proposing to our customer. From a uh, who we are, you know, perspective, uh, continuing on with that, again, a, a big focus on through the years, traditionally with, with large enterprises, uh, that's where a lot of our uh, 
employees come from? Is that either you know technology firms that have that have solutions that that large enterprises rely on, but also just having the experience from a, a, a partner and a customer perspective, you know, to bring to the table as well. We invest heavily in these and really cover all, all customer segments and really everything across uh, the IT, what I call the IT value t- chain or what we call the IT value chain. And I'll get into that. Really anything uh, that happens within IT, we can help, you know, solution uh, and, uh, you know, take a look at what a company is trying to get, get done and, and help, uh, you know, make that a reality for them. So, you know, with that, really just, uh, again, uh, whether or not we can really, because we view ourselves as an extension to the team and really work towards becoming that with our customers, we're going to do the do the right thing for our customers. So that could be even a solution area that we don't, we can't really help with, you know, if we can help find the right person or help, help uh, move that timeline along, you know, to, to help uh, get, get to a, a solution for you in that area, we'll do that. So always looking... Uh, looking out for the best interests of our customers. Uh, obviously, we can do some do some things from a uh, finance perspective to help with you know the, the way that you acquire the technology, some flexibility along those lines. And and uh, uh, we we've been since our existence a minority owned business to to help uh, with diversity initiatives that you might have as well. And before I uh, we get into the topic for today, just a, a little bit more about what we do from a a uh, focus area. I talked about that IT value chain. Uh, really, our, our core is in the data center. You know, uh, where a lot of our customers have made investments through the years. Uh, many with us, just helping them take a look at the landscape today, where some of those workloads might need to, you know, uh, might work better from a, a cloud perspective. Uh, so, really covering that. Anything from a process, a strat- strategic planning portfolio rationalization, that all kind of fits in that DevOps and observability pillar. And then digital workspace kind of, we, we view that as really edge type of solutions, right? Anything outside of the data center, whether that's remote workforce or, or IoT use cases, you know, all those uh, uh, things that, that occur outside of the data center and user type of uh, initiatives and, and uh, solutioning, uh, we, we would slot into that area. Uh, of course, uh, you know, looking at the at the slide here, security and analytics, uh, a big part of really everything we do across all those four, uh, focus areas, the application of analytics to help with, uh, you know, just, just better understanding what's occurring within the environment, not only just from a uh, IT perspective, but from a business perspective as well. It's kind of a given these days that uh, an analytics uh, perspective is brought in uh, with any solution that's that's proposed for our customers. We offer strategic services, and really what what uh, we're getting at there is we have canned services that can deliver on specific things to to quickly get to a baseline. Uh, but many times, you know. Uh, every customer is a little bit different and we uh, we need to do, uh, do do something custom for that particular engagement. And that's what we refer to as strategic services, understanding what try- the customer is trying to get done and then uh, moving forward with uh, making that a reality for them. In addition to that, uh, offer, you know, managed service offerings to our customers, uh, really of all sizes. Uh, in different areas uh, of their organization, but you know, give the, the customer that experience of letting us take it over the, the operational day-to-day activities, a part of that at a pre-established fee that makes sense for the, the customer's business. So uh, uh, those are the offerings that, that uh, we focus on here at Mobius Partners. And then I took briefly just wanted, you know, from a services perspective, you know, we talked about strategic services. This is kind of the high level methodology that we focus on to deliver on those services. So in each one of these pillars, uh, assess, architect, transform, transition, mobiize, you know, <laughs> all of those are uh, areas that we, you know, deliver specific services depending on, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what, what you're trying to accomplish from an organization perspective. So that's a, that's a, a quick overview of, what we're doing here at uh, Mobius Partners. So I wanted to transition into the, the topic for today's webinar. So let me introduce uh, James Morrison at HPE. Uh, James is a cybersecurity technologist with HPE. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, James, uh, I think it's uh, maybe going on three years, two, three years for you with HPE and a long history 
and cybersecurity, uh, 22 years of experience with the FBI, 30 plus years in the field of IT, college computer engineering degree, as well as an MBA in technical management. And I won't go into all the certifications. I know it's a huge, <laughs> I know it's a huge list there, James. I yeah, appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Scott. Uh, you know, thanks, Mobius, for bringing me on board. As introduced, uh, my name is James Morrison. Um, I've been with HPE since December of 19. Um, math is hard, right? So whatever that is, uh, 17 months, I guess, at this point. Uh, did 22 years with the FBI. I'm out of the Houston area. Um, so I, I finished my career in Houston, uh, 14 in the Albuquerque area, and then eight years Air Force prior to that. But I've been doing IT a long time. Um, I was a self-taught programmer back in the 80s, uh, like a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of got into it because of games and stuff like that. Um, and so I've, I've been, I've really, uh, uh, you know, I've been really focused around the idea of cybersecurity over the last years. Well, unfortunately, 2021 has shown itself going to be a pain, just like 2020 was. Um, ransomware is really becoming the, the uh, attack uh, that we're, we're, we're seeing more and more of. Sadly, what we're also seeing, though, is that the, the criminal groups are coming after more money. Um, the, the, the average ransomware payment last year has doubled, or in early 2020 has already doubled. Um, we've seen uh, even small companies are getting hit with uh, payments of $10,000. Um, so uh, if you've heard me speak in the past, the first thing I always say is that everyone's a target. That has continued to be the, the reality. Unfortunately, that will continue to go forward. Um, I'll talk about the Mandiant report later, um, but Mandiant showed the number of groups that they were tracking doubled last year, and it's almost doubled another time into 2021. And so there's over 300 different criminal and nation state groups operating now out on the internet. Um, it's, so, it's so lucrative right now that some ransomware groups are actually making enough money and then going out of business. Um, QLocker announced yesterday or the day before that they were actually shutting their doors because they made enough money in their attack. Um, that's just reality of, of the world. Um, also, what we've all seen is that only about 8% of organizations receive their data back after paying that ransom. A lot of times you'll hear the conversation of, you know, do I pay the ransom? Uh, Colonial Pipeline, which is a very large attack and, and probably uh, in front of mind for a lot of people, they paid $5 million um, to get their data back. Um, and they still ended up uh, not getting all of their data back even after paying that $5 million. These hackers can't guarantee you that even if they give you the decryptor key that they're gonna be able to actually recover the data that they encrypted. A lot of times it's a one-way encryption. So um, we have to start changing our, our thought process around this. Paying the ransom is not gonna be enough. Um, and if, if your ransomware avoidance is, well, I have insurance, my insurance will help me pay for it. Please recognize that that's changing very quickly. Um, rans insurance companies are getting less likely to cover ransomware payments because it has been so, uh, so, so lucrative over the last few years. And it's becoming very expensive to get ransomware uh, um, insurance. In addition, the amount of downtime from a ransomware attack is going up. Realize that this downtime is not just around, uh, you know, paying the, the ransom and getting the data decryptor. This is how long it takes to take your entire network offline and then reinstall. Uh, ransomware in today's world is, is very pervasive. Um, and so even if you know, they give you the decryptor, you're gonna have to guarantee that they are no longer on your network, which means you're gonna have to reload every device on that network. And when I say every device, I mean every device, um, not just laptops and, and you know, uh, computers, but every phone that connects to your network, every IoT device, every router, every printer, because we've seen ransomware be able to deploy itself into those kind of devices and then reinfect networks. So you're going to have a lot of downtime. And if you don't have an, a large IT staff, that means you're gonna to have to hire somebody to come in and actually uh, recover your network. The reason is very simple. This is cash driven. 90% of crime is driven by uh, you know, this underground cash economy. It's actually being driven also by cryptocurrency. About 90% of Bitcoin transactions are illicit and are tied to underground either drug trade or to uh, cyber crime. So by 2025, it'll be $10 trillion. This year, it'll be somewhere around $6 trillion to the worldwide economy. We have to understand that because of that, um, they, the number of groups attacking us will continue to increase. We're also having an increasing expanding attack surface. Working from home only increased that even more. 
um, network devices at home, things like ring doorbells and, and voice activated devices and, and uh, all of those are now indirectly connected into these corporate environments. So how are you going to protect your corporate environment from this, uh, these networks that are connected to you via VPN? We, we have somewhat of a false sense of security because we use VPN, but all VPN does is, is encrypt the data between the endpoint and your network. It doesn't do anything to protect the endpoint. So endpoint security is becoming increasingly a conversation around that, even if that endpoint is a home network um, or if that, if that uh, endpoint is a mobile device that's not owned by you. Um, so this threat landscape will continue to evolve they're getting even more sophisticated. We've seen a rise in what we call double uh, extortion and triple extortion, where they encrypt your data, but they also steal the data. Last year, 60% of ransomware attacks also incorporated the data theft. Um, that number so far in 2021 has been higher than that. Um, as many as 70 to 75% of ransomware attacks in 2021 have also included stealing the data. There's also a new criminal group that says that they're encrypting your data, but actually what they're doing is they're wiping all of your data and then putting fake data in the back. So you'll pay to get your data restored, but your data was already gone. Um, so these criminal groups are, are becoming more sophisticated, finding different ways to uh, try to get money out of you. Um, so remember that and understand if you're gonna spend that money, if you're going to be, be ready to spend the money on, on paying for the ransom, why wouldn't we put the money on the front end and try to be more proactive? Um, so cybersecurity overall requires a more holistic approach. We've got to recognize that these criminals are focusing on our data and data is the currency. So uh, HPE and a lot of other tech companies, our world is now focused on data security and workload security. We understand the networks have to be secure, not saying that's changed, but if we focus more on what is really being targeted and, and recognize that uh, if I have even uh, you know, DLP in place, which allows me uh, you know, to encrypt the data in bulk, if they steal that data, it's not of any use to them. So we have to have a continued idea around data in all of its states, data at rest on your hard drives, data in flow you know, that comes across your network, as well as data residing in memory. So protection, detection, and recovery are, are cru crucial to that. Because wherever your data flows, security has to follow. We have to get to that idea of recognizing that my data is the target, my data flow and where my data resides is where these criminals are going to focus at. So Mandiant came out with its new report. If you, have, if you ever have some spare time or you enjoy this kind of stuff, it was very interesting because it talked about this multi, multifaceted extortion and how not only are they gonna steal your data, which is the double extortion, but they're also gonna publish your name on a name and shame website. A lot of these criminal groups are actually posting websites where they will tell all of your customers about how you were hit by an attack. Um, they will also, we've seen cases where they've launched ransomware attacks and as they're launching that attack, they have sent an email out to the entire customer database. They've stolen the customer database and then sent an email out to all of those customers saying, oh, by the way, this company that you've done business with has suffered a data breach and um, you know, they're, you know, they, they have ransomware attacks and an attempt to coerce you to pay that ransom. In some cases, that ransom, they wanted you to pay two or three times the ransom amount. What's interesting also last year is that we, in 2019 and 2020 showed it as well, is the indirect attack has become a rising standpoint or a rising feature. Not just, I'm not coming directly after you, I'm coming after those people that feed into your network. Um, so any of the subcontractors that you might work with. Um, I was talking to education uh, groups yesterday and construction companies that might be doing work for, for uh, you know, schools are often targeted. Law firms, we've seen that for years where law firms were targeted because they hold, um, they have connectivity into corporate networks. Um, uh, we see that with medical all the time where, um, you know, I may not be able to go after the big hospitals, but I can go after those smaller uh, doctor's offices that feed into that large hospital system and attempt to uh, get uh, data out of that system. So recognize that we're all part of an ecosystem. Um, and because we're part of that ecosystem, we have to start expecting the people that feed into us to actually have a higher incident of cybersecurity. And that means that we should also uh, expect to be required to have higher security from people that we feed into as well. So my question is very simple. What's it gonna take? 
what is it going to take for you to start planning for a ransomware event, a ransomware event? What is your line? I, I'm, I'm always amazed that we see these very large attacks that have gone on, you know, things, of course, you know, we saw solar winds and we've seen, you know, the colonial uh, pipeline. We saw Microsoft exchange servers being hit this year. Um, what, when is it going to, when is it going to be enough? When, what is going to be that, that seminal moment that's going to say, wow, I guess it's time for us to start having a plan. So, because proper investment is the key to this. Okay. Uh, and when you talk to, you know, Mobius, you know, and, and start having that conversation with them around your security transformation, you want to make sure that you, you have a very clear picture of where you're trying to go and then let them help you get to that solution. And I, I liked, uh, you know, Scott's comment around that, that, you know, Mobius is going to help you, you know, get to the solution you need, even if sometimes it isn't a logo, you know, that, that they, like we own. And I, I tell that even within HPE, when I'm talking to customers, I want you to find that solution. Sometimes it's not going to be me and maybe a partnership, but we've got to get more secure. And that means we've got to start deploying better security products across. Now, outside of any technology, you've got to have an incident response plan. You've got to make sure that you have a, a, a backup plan that and it tested your backups. There's a statistic that shows 75% of our backups have failed when we need them. External security evaluations, implementing multi-factor authentication, encrypting data at rest. In addition, with ransomware, what we've also started to see is this. When a, when a criminal target drops uh, data or goes after your network, the first thing they often do is create their own uh, system administrator domain uh, admin account. What they'll do is when they're launching their attack is they will lock out every other person in that Active Directory. So the only login they have is their sysadmin. They will also, in many cases, totally delete access databases to the domain controllers. So you're going to have a huge issue restoring your data if you can't even gain access to those networks. And then the last thing, and I, I'm going to hit this every time, backup and restoration processes were insufficient. They were not designed around resiliency. Now, NSA came out with its top 10 mitigation strategies. And I, I'm always fascinated by you know, NSA and CISA because updates, patching, patching software. Um, I would say that 75% of the attacks that we've seen against companies in the last two years, including these major ransomware attacks, have targeted vulnerabilities in which the software could have been patched, but was not. Updates and knowing what level of software you have running is going to be crucial, crucially important. In addition, defending your accounts, defending the privileged accounts. I talk to a lot of sysadmins, and they, they're sometimes a little too casual on how they log into networks. But if I'm a bad guy, I want your sysadmin login. And I'm going to get that sysadmin login, and then I'm going to create my own account. So watching for those kind of uh, those shadow accounts being created. Um, I actually was talking to one company and that's how they found out they were getting ready to get hit with ransomware is uh, one, of the, one of their sysadmins was checking accounts and saw this new sysadmin account and he blocked that account just before they launched the software and they found the, the uh, executables for the ransomware in their network. And so they had just avoided that attack. In addition, you know, from ransomware protection, email filtering, we've got to have it, right? That's the, a major attack surface. I've talked about patching. I've talked about endpoint security. We've got to, we've got to have you know, secure every endpoint, no matter what it is in our network. We have to separate admin privileges. Um, we have to make sure that our admins aren't logging in all the time with an admin account, or they're not using the same password across multiple accounts. Whitelisting of applications. Um, you know, I need to know when an application has been modified and then be flagged when that application is changed. And then lastly, the idea of a good backup. These criminal groups will come after your backups. And if your backup is a standard backup on a, uh, like a Buffalo drive, they will delete those backups or they will overwrite them. So the old military rule was three, two, one for backups. Three backups, two different mediums, one in an offsite. There are technologies out there right now that can vault your backups into a separate network so that should somebody delete or try to alter your backups, you will have that offsite backup that you can, you can use to recover your network. But ransomware is not just about recovery, it's also about becoming better at avoidance. So our networks are gonna to continue to evolve. Uh, our adversary will continue to innovate. 
Um, we will always be short of people in this, in this IT and the cybersecurity realm, but realize overall, your business depends on security. You have to start recognizing it. Security is not an IT issue. And I, 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 I say that all the time, but security is not an IT issue. It is a corporate issue and it is a risk issue. And so as when we, we, when we engage it in that way and recognize that all of our people have to be, have to be uh, motivated to have a better security model, we'll start having a different, a different outcome in our networks. So that's the end of my presentation. And uh, if we wanna go into more of a chat at this point. Yeah, we certainly yeah, should, Dan. Dan. Thank you uh, for uh, uh, that update and stuff. Just lots of, we have our minds racing right now as far as just discussion points there. Fly high and fast. That's the old Air Force uh, thing for me is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Um, so yeah, Shannon, um, jump in here as well, but uh, we'll move over to the discussion phase here. I know uh, uh, maybe, maybe you kick us off with one of the discussion topics there, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, I thought it'd be interesting to chat about, um, you know, the FBI entering the hacking game, um, which, of course, they don't refer to it as that, right? They were uh, doing what uh, they were calling active defense and uh, reaching out to clean up those web shells on the exchange servers. But obviously, uh, unprecedented that uh, a law enforcement agency, right, has taken an active role without asking for permission, right, to fix people's systems. Um, so obviously, intent was good, but uh, uh, definitely... Uh, an unusual change in approach. Uh, what are your thoughts about the government taking that kind of active role? Here's, here's what I think happened. And, I'll, and I, this is going to sound kind of funny. Let's say, they, let's say they knew that there were 100 servers that have been infected with these web shells. So if we went through the US process, the normal process, they would have to serve 100 notifications to these, these people, these different companies, and would have had the, or would have had to go and get search warrants or whatever for 100 companies. Instead, if they had, which I'm sure they did, they had the ability to control the server, the command and control server for those web shells. What they were able to do then is go enter the web shell command and control. And they, and they actually deleted the web shells using the own, in, the web shells internal software. So it comes down to a little bit of a, not saying right or wrong, I'm just saying this is why they did it. It was easier for them to get a search warrant for one server that is the command and control server for those web shells than it was to get a hundred or however many you know, companies they asked or uh, entered to then ask to delete those web shells from the distant end. So it's a very interesting, I, I thought it was, a, it, was, it was an interesting legalese um, knowing the bureau and of course spending all that time with them. It probably came down to, well, if we have access to the command and control, we can just delete these web shells from inside. Um, so I, that, that was why they did it. Um, I think, does it set a bad precedent? It could. Um, it, it's going to create a, a world where if, if let's, let's say not next time it's the NSA gaining access to the command and control, if the NSA then turns around and deletes web shells, let's say from the inside, are they exceeding their authority? Um, I, think, I think there's going to be a lot more conversation around that. And I don't know, I don't know if it's a good or a bad at this point, right? <laughs> um, uh, the other thing is, I think is kind of possible, is if I went to a company and said, hey, you have this web shell on your network and you need to delete it, a lot of companies would come back and say, well, how do you know about it? Well, if it's classified, which it often is, I can't tell you how I know about it. And a lot of companies will ignore the threat. I mean, honestly, I had that happen a lot of times where companies would say, well, if you can't tell me specifically why or how you know about it, then I think you're full of it. So instead, if they came through this way, they don't have to tell you anything about how they broke into that network. They just did it. So it's, I think there's, we always argued about classification in cyber. Um, there, it was, there's a lot of overclassification. We always felt that there were some challenges, especially when we went out to businesses. So it's kind of a dancing answer, but I think that's probably why they did it the way they did it. Yeah, with some plausible deniability included with that. The, uh... Absolutely. Uh, all they did was they took, the, they'll say it this way, they took down a criminal network from the command and control of the criminal network. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll let y'all figure out where that sits. Yeah, definitely uh, an interesting dance from that perspective. So yeah. obviously with um, you know, the, the pandemic obviously changed the security threat landscape, right? With the sudden shift to work from home 
and now we're starting to see the, the flow back into the office, um, obviously with the wide distribution of the vaccine. Um, do you think we'll see any changes in cybersecurity threats as we see that shift coming from the work from home and going back into the office? Yeah, I think what's gonna end up happening is, is the work from home will probably always be there now. Um, I think the numbers I saw prior to COVID were six to 8% of US workforce worked more than half time from home. That number will probably go up to about 45%. And you'll have a lot of people who are in this mixed mode where they continue to sort of log in remotely. So it, it, it expands everybody's network. Everybody's network will be expanded to home. Um, I also expect a lot more data breaches to be noticed now once people come back into the work center um, because somebody could have been in that network and you just never knew, right? Um, you know, and, and it's not, and now as we get so people coming back into the workplace, I think you're gonna see more realization that some of these networks have been breached. But once, once Pandora's box is open and we have people working from home, you're never gonna be able to get that back. Um, there will always be people that wanna continue to work from home. So it's gonna stretch our IT staffs even more. They are always gonna have to be prepared to deploy, you know, virtual desktop infrastructures or VPN, you know, or Citrix logins. Um, and it's gonna be kind of haphazard. Um, so it's, it's, it's unfortunately gonna a lot of times fall on our IT. Security is gonna to have to start being more, um, uh, more dynamic in its segmentation. Uh, we see a lot more conversation around device discovery, dynamic segmentation, and uh, behavioral analytics. I think are gonna be the, the future of cybersecurity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, AI and ML have been you know, very integral to making security more effective. Um, probably one of the bigger changes that we've seen going on in the industry. I do think it's interesting that the work from home shift and, and the pandemic did actually seem to help create a new industry, uh, SASE, um, which you know was existed prior to that. But as we saw everybody going to their houses and working from home and trying to figure out how to do that in a secure way and get it done quickly, um, it seemed that really helped make SASE a, a reality of the secure access service edge. Um, well, we jumped in, right? So I mean, that so was a big benefit. Yeah, HPE jumped into that and bought Silver Peak late last year. I mean, we recognize that um, you know that's that's the future. Um, that that edge that edge access is going to be a, a big future for every company, um, and the cloud is going to be pushing closer to the edge too. You're going to see more access points, uh, you know, pushing out. And um, I, I just think, yeah, it's it's our networks are supposed to be what 100. I actually saw that number increase, 200 uh, to terabytes, no petabytes, no exabytes, something exabytes. like that of, of data, right? By by 2025, you know, and most of it's moving laterally through our network east west. That's crazy amounts of data. Um, and unfortunately, if we stick into an old paradigm uh, where we think that we're gonna have one firewall with one entry and exit point, I think we're probably, that's that's gone. I think that one's gone the way of the, the dodo bird. Yeah, I mean, I, there's uh, another important aspect of that and that's, you know, SASE is, you're paying someone else to help you with security, right? And, and I think that's an important shift in focus as well because is security is, is very fast and it's very complicated. And to think that any business should be a security expert, you know, isn't realistic, right? It's, are you a retailer or are you in security business, right? Are you in manufacturing or are you in security? And so the idea of working with your vendors and partners to become secure, I think is an important shift in mindset that uh, I, I think is a good outcome of that. Well, so companies, every company wants to be able to do what they do best, right? Um, if, if I'm a if I'm a retailer, I just want to do retail. I don't want to think about security. I don't I don't want I don't want to have to ha you know be also this expert like you said in IT. So that's why working with you know first of all working with partnerships like Mobius, but then also making sure that the technology isn't making the job harder. I mean, how many of us have walked into a place and they're say, oh, uh, we're moving slow because the computer is slow. Wait a second. Wasn't the computer supposed to make our life better, faster? You know, but but we 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 end up falling back on that a lot. We've got to change that, and make it so that our 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 computers are making life better, faster, um, and actually making the user experience more transparent. So as we talk about things like cloud transformation, if the cloud makes life slower, nobody's going to want it. The cloud's got to make life the same at minimum, if not better. So I think there's a lot of that conversation around there as well. Absolutely. So the, uh, any uh, new trends or security tools that you've seen uh, popping up 
uh, lately that uh, folks might want to look into? Well, so we've got a, so we're, we're looking at, so we acquired a company called Sidetail last year. And Sidetail uh, was a uh, initial founder in a, um, a standard called Spiffy. And Spiffy is a, uh, it's, a, it's a, taking security around the services. So if we look at like SolarWinds, for example, the SolarWinds service, which is running on their Orion appliance, had, uni had universal access or uh, unlimited access into our, their corporate environments. And because, that, because it didn't have to re-authenticate, it had that, that you know, bulk authentication, it was just able to do what it was doing. Nobody was noticing it. So as we look at Spiffy and Spire, we think that, that as we push forward, we're going to take authentication at the services level. So every service now has to re-authenticate. In addition, you know, we've moved into you know, containerization. Um, you know, we, you know, we talk about when virtualization was the first thing, right? You had one server running four or multiple operating systems. Well, now you'll have one VM running multiple applications within that VM. So it's taking it even more at that granular level. Um, in addition, we've doubled down on the idea around uh, consumption models. Um, why, why should somebody go out and buy a server when they can buy the hard disk space that they need or the, the, uh, um, buy the cores they need or the RAM they need? So we're going to start kind of, you're going to start seeing that separation of server uh, across across the you know so you buy what you need at when you need it not try to, to buy this one computer so we're moving in that direction um we're also uh uh adding more security into our backup systems right so we came out with a new backup system um tied around store once um you know which i think from a ransomware recovery is part of this right it has to be ransomware recovery uh, and having that immutable backup but in addition uh, we're building relationships with companies, you know, like uh, you know CrowdStrike and, and you know and and some of those user behavior analytics companies to help us make a more more robust security posture. And I think you're going to see more of that. Um, cybersecurity, we're starting to see more of these partnerships forming, and we're also seeing more of the um, some acquisitions um, as companies kind of realize that other companies have have good product lines. So I think I think we're going to continue to see the, the that landscape change. Yeah, backups has probably always been the the least sexy of all of the uh, you know IT technologies, but obviously critical to the um, uh, infrastructure as anything else. And um, I, I think the recent increase in ransomware has helped revive focus on backups um, and in making those companies and startups be more innovative. And you know, you mentioned the the immutable copyright. It's I need to have a good backup and I need to know it hasn't changed. And we actually now seeing security being applied to the backups, you know, after the fact, right? Scanning of backups after they've been written to tape, right? For the, the double check of, has it been infected? Is this a good backup or not? Um, so well, I often the, tell uh, people, you know, why don't you, you got to check to make sure that whatever you're backing up is enough to actually bring you back to whatever your minimum business model is, sure. right? Um, and a lot of times people sort of just presume that it says successful, right? You know, so they ran a backup and it said successful. We must be good. <laughs> well, not necessarily. It, it, it succeeded at backing up whatever you told it to back up. And so I think it's very important to make sure that we, we're checking to make sure we have enough. The second part of it is, is we've got to avoid this double, um, you know, this uh, double extortion that we're seeing in ransomware. Um, make sure that your data isn't, even if somebody steals it, it should be useless to them. You know, you know, uh, you know, data privacy laws are going to continue to move forward. Uh, we saw Virginia pass a very comprehensive uh, privacy law here this year. Um, I think there's 10 other states going to pass the same thing. And I think there's more conversation around a federal privacy law as well, kind of like the GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're going to see, uh, we saw an executive order come out on May 18th around cybersecurity from President Biden. Um, there's a lot of conversation around cybersecurity and, and how we need to secure um, not just the federal government, but private companies that feed into, you know, into the U.S. Yeah, I think there, um, there has been talks of um, the TSA, which is responsible for overseeing the pipeline uh, infrastructure in the U.S., obviously Colonial being a very recent um, impact on the eastern seaboard there with the uh, gas supply. Um, so the talks are that they're actually going to make it a compliance requirement that if they have a security incident, you know, you're required to report it to the federal government. Um, obviously, that's a, you know, uh, on the surface, obviously a good thing, but then also there's, 
that goes back to privacy concerns, right? And, and that those lines become very blurred, right? Is which one is the uh, more important focus? It's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy balance that we're trying to find, right? Because how do we do information sharing without, without punishing the person who's sharing the information, right? So, I mean, if, if Colonial came out and said, hey, we made a mistake, you know, and, and we did this, but here's what we did. And, you know, everybody would beat them about the head and shoulders, right? So there's this, this middle ground of how do we, like, you know, Microsoft, Microsoft Exchange servers were being targeted and they were trying to patch the vulnerability. But in, when the vulnerability was announced, the criminals attacked them before they had a chance to patch. So there's, there's this sort of middle ground that we can't, haven't found the answer to yet. Um, you know, we in the FBI always tried to have that kind of relationship, but every, no, people didn't trust the FBI necessarily to protect the information or not come after them from a criminal standpoint. So I think information sharing has to be, we have to create a different information sharing model. And I think one thing that they've done is create this new ransomware task force. I'm interested to see what comes out of that. Um, I mean, I, unfortunately the government sometimes has a knee jerk reaction uh, that might be successful, but it has to have sustaining power. It ha can't be something that we're doing in the short term that doesn't have long-term implica implications for you know, changing security. Sure. So one of the questions that came in through the chat is, you know, how does a, a company justify their security investment or how do they know they're spending the right amount? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it's necessarily just about money. I think it's about what are you trying to do? I mean, you need to attain, first of all, if you have an incident response plan and you have a security framework in place and you've had an external security evaluation done, these are things that aren't necessarily high, high cost. But you know, if you've taken care of the critical, let's say you do a security evaluation and you have five critical finds, right? And you patch those five critical finds, then you've done what needs to be done right now. And then you can try to mitigate other, other findings. But if you don't even have a, a security evaluation done and something happens, ignorance isn't going to save us. Um, we can't sit there and say, well, you know, I didn't know. Well, you, you could find out. And so I think, I think uh, what your budget is is going to depend a lot on what industry you're in, too. Um, you know, financial sector is more regulated than other sectors. Um, I think you're going to see more regulation hitting healthcare soon, um, just because you know, we had a lot of healthcare hits last year. Um, uh, I think when we look at Sarbanes, Oxley, especially publicly held companies are going to become more responsible for revealing cyber events. Even in Texas, uh, we, the data breach notification law changed last year. And I think it's only 250, if you lose 250 records, I think you have to notify the DIR. I have to check the numbers, but it's a very low bar that says if you, if you lose the data over to, of 250 Texans or more, you have to notify the state. Um, so, I mean, we can't hide from it. Um, now, you know, what we have to start doing is just start first. I, I, I always say start with the security evaluation. Know what, you got to know what you know before you can decide how much money you need to spend. And then, then you can figure out what your budget needs to be. Yeah. And obviously security is often, uh, IT security is often um, compared with, you know, the insurance business, right? It's spend enough money to offset your risk and what's your risk level, right? How much risk are you willing to take on as a business? Um, and still always a, a worthy comparison, but the difference is it used to be that the assumption is like, I may or may not be hacked, you know, so I'm gonna weigh my risks, you know, and, and I think the world has changed from, it's not if I'm going to be hacked, it's, it's when and how many times. And so it's no longer just a simple of, did I spend enough money to offset my risk? Because it, it doesn't matter how much you spend, you can still be hacked and you still have to make those efforts. And there's uh, always, those threats are growing and changing. So. It, it's now a world of, you know, when and how often am I going to be hacked? And, and more importantly, it's not, can I stop being hacked? Because we know that you can't stop it forever. It's how quickly can you detect it, right? And that's um, right. one of the changes that we've seen in the security world. It's you have to assume you're going to be hacked, but what are you doing to detect it when it happens? And, you know, the, the number is somewhere in the hundreds of days, right? 200 and something days on average. And, you know, everyone has a slightly different number for that. But, you know, it's 200 plus days on average that it takes an organization to find that they've been hacked. And that's where uh, I think we really all need to put a lot more focus is on how, how do you find it after the fact? Because it's going to happen. 
Well, that's that's it. I mean, you know, there was an old, I think it was a director Mueller that said, you know, there's two kinds of companies, right? Those that have been hacked and know it, and those that have been hacked and don't know it. Um, and that note, we always changed it and said, now there's two kinds of companies. Those have been hit, and those are going to get hit again. Um, you know, we have to learn lessons. Uh, we have to we have to you know recognize if you get hit, there's no excuse for you not to patch what what happened for you between the hit one and hit two. And I can't tell you the number of times I went out to companies that were hit a second time with ransomware, and I'm like. Did you fix anything between one and two? Well, okay, that's a no. Um, you know, we we you know you have to we have to do everything possible, and sometimes it's low tech. If your budget is only fifty thousand dollars, okay, that's fine. But do something with it. Um, not doing anything is not an answer. Um, and 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 you know there are a lot of security solutions, and you know I, I put some of those out there that don't cost any money. Having an incident response plan, you can download framework from you know NIST. And, and create your own incident response plan. Having a disaster recovery plan, that doesn't require any extra money. Um, you know, uh, getting, a, getting a security evaluation, that may not cost you that much. I mean, it depends. I mean, I had no companies that charge a fairly low amount for pen tests. Um, but don't, don't think that you can't do security because you can't afford it. Um, talking to Mobius, talking to a partnership and saying, listen, here's, what, here's my budget, here's what I want to do. Then we can try to make it happen. Uh, we we can figure out ways to uh, to you know get you forward, but to sit still and not do anything is just not smart in today's world. Yeah, and, and I'm I think it's to some extent stuff. maybe just a, a a cost of doing business, uh, right, James? I mean, there's got to be some number uh, throughout the evaluation process from a security perspective. What what happens? You know, the risk. Take a look at the risk that Shannon you brought up. But you're really trying to understand why you know. What what it what it is that is at risk? What does that mean to the business? And and you know, there's other factors too around just do you want to control that internally? And do you have the expertise internally to work to deal with this stuff? Or maybe looking at an outside provider to provide, uh, you know, to to give you that you know, the secure capabilities and stuff. So just different options that go into that evaluation that will then drive. Hey, You're uh, absolutely right. I mean, this is our right budget, right? Yeah. Except first of all. And you're, you're right, understand this is a corporate risk question, okay? This is not an IT question. This is not, it's not even a budget question. It is a corporate risk question to begin with. Then as a company, you have to then establish how much is that risk worth, right? So when I'm setting my budget, that's when the conversation needs to have happen as to, you know, what can I spend on it? Not, oh, well, here's your $50,000, go figure out how to handle our risk. I mean, it's, we, we've got it a little bit backwards because I think a lot of times companies say, well, it's an IT issue, not an IT issue at all. It's, it's, a, it's a corporate issue. And so I think that we just have to turn that conversation around. And once we turn it around, money becomes a little bit more fluid once the board of directors or the, you know, the executives start recognizing that this is what could happen to them. I think we're uh, getting close to the end, maybe exceeded our time here a little bit. Uh, Oops. Let's keep us on track <laughs> here. Uh, maybe if there's another question out there to Shannon, uh, we could take those. But uh, yes, we'll uh, wrap this thing up here pretty quick. Yeah. So, so, so one more question from the field: uh, How how often does a business need to get a vulnerability assessment? Um, I've heard every I've heard external every two years maybe. Um, I would also though suggest that if you have a major change in your environment. Like, so if you implement a new, a big software product, right? So like, um, you know, if you put a new database in, probably a good idea if you do a major overhaul to, of a network to probably get one done. Um, but if your network doesn't change, I think you can do it every two years and you probably would be relatively safe-ish. Yeah, except I don't know any businesses that don't change in two years. <laughs> well, that's, that's my point, right? <laughs> It? You know, it? I mean, if you if you rip out all your servers and you put in brand new HPE servers, probably not a bad idea to maybe a few months later after the, the dust is settled to go get an evaluation done just to know because everything you add to your network adds risk, right? Every device that you add to your network adds a level of risk. You have to be able to measure that risk and you have to know of the vulnerabilities of it. Um, so if all of a sudden you go to a new voice over IP system or a new, you know, put all your video cameras on IP, Probably a good idea to do a risk assessment to know if those cameras are adding unnecessary risk to your network. Yeah, definitely. All right, Scott, I'll hand it back over to you. All right, yeah, now I think uh, just uh, 
huge topics really we could go on and on and on about that uh, hopefully the, the folks listening in got some value out of today's discussion i really appreciate once again your time uh, uh one last thank you to uh, james and shannon for the participation and expertise today really appreciate it um, if there's any interest uh, for those listening in and you know getting further information around the topics covered uh, don't hesitate to reach out to to liz uh, who is the you know, the sponsor of the event here today uh, or your local Mobius sales team. But again, appreciate your time. Everybody enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe out there. Thank you all, everybody.